So last weekend, Pastor Patina began our message series, Thanksgiving, um, in three tenses, past, present, and future. And she talked about the value of giving God thanks for our past. And she did uh, a great job. If you didn't hear that message, my recommendation is you go to the, uh, to the website and, and uh, watch that. Uh, it's valuable. I just want to use one of her quotes. I, I think I've got it on the slide here. Be thankful for your past. Remind yourself of what God has done so you can find rest in your present. She talked about how important it is not to forget all the places that God has been in our life. And this morning, I'm going to talk to you about thanking God in the present. And I kind of put this message series together. And um, of the three sermons, this is the one that I wanted to preach the least. (laughs) And let me tell you why. Because I don't know where you're at in your life, but there are times in my life when my present is not good. I've got struggles, I've got difficulties, I've got challenges. Maybe it's, it's health or wealth or, or job or maybe it's relational. There's, there's just stuff going on in all of our lives that challenges us in the present to find the source of our thanksgiving. And so that's the task that's before me. And, and uh, so let me just pray for us as I, I get ready to share this message with you. As ever, God, when one of your servants stands to speak, speak the loudest and the clearest to that servant. Amen. So I was seven years old. My father's brother and his wife and their two boys were coming in from out of town. They, they grew up in the town that we lived in, and lots of people knew them. So when my dad told some people that they were coming back for a visit, folks said, oh, we want to see them. And my dad heard from so many people that he decided to set up a, a, a dinner that we would all have together. And we had this barbecue place in the town that I grew up in. And whenever our family would have special occasions, we would end up at Young's Barbecue. And so word got around. And so when that night came, all kinds of people turned out to visit with my uncle and his wife. And, and so, you know, it was, we kind of took over about half the restaurant. And I don't know, you've probably been a part of that where they just start sliding tables together. And your party just takes up a big portion of the restaurant. So here I am, I'm seven years old. Some of the people around the table, I have no idea who they even are. And I'm the youngest one there. And so there's all this visiting going on. These people are talking, and these people are talking, everybody's talking, and, and no one's getting food, which is my concern. That's why I'm there. And so the server finally comes over, and she's trying to get our drink orders, and nobody's really being very cooperative because uh, they're visiting. And back when I was a kid, getting, a, getting to go out to dinner was a pretty big deal. And getting a Coke was a big deal. This was, forget about free refills. That was, that was not a thing back then. But, so she takes all of our drink orders. I'm like, I would like a Coke. Finally, she brings our drinks. And she gives me my drink. And I look at it. And about halfway down inside my glass is a fly. <sighs> hey, Dad. Dad. Brian, be quiet. I'm, I'm visiting with your uncle. Dad, Brian, be quiet. Mom, mom, I got I to gotta talk to you. Brian, be quiet. But I got to talk to you. I was so desperate. My brother, Mark, who's six years older, I was even asking him for help. And I don't know if you have siblings, but my brother for about a decade didn't answer any of my questions without being irritated or ticked off. Like, like somehow my existence bothered him. So I read, hey, Mark, Mark, there's a fly in my Coke. He's like, handle it. Go get yourself another Coke. So I get up and I go to the front and they had this row of um, 
uh, the stools where you could just sit by yourself and, and order. And so I'm standing there by the stools hoping that someone will notice me. Finally, the server notices me, and she's like, what, what, what do you need, young man? I'm like, there's a fly in my Coke. So she's, you know, really busy, but she takes it and she disappears for way too long, in my opinion. She finally comes back and she gives me my glass. And so I turn around to head back to the table and she says, young man, you don't say thank you? And I was not trying to be sarcastic. I just said, thank you for putting a fly in my Coke. (laughs) Somehow my mother, who had heard nothing else that I had said, (laughs) heard every word of that interchange. And suddenly I'm in the parking lot getting some very specific instructions on when to give thanks and when not to. You know, through our years growing up, through our years experiencing things in life, we learn some things about Thanksgiving, or we don't. Many of the lessons that we learn happen in places like this. We'll we'll read scripture and we'll say, you know what, I want to remember that. Or we'll hear something in a sermon given by a pastor and we say, you know what she said is true. I'm going to remember that. That's, that's, that's right about Thanksgiving. Or maybe we'll hear it in a class that we're taking or a Sunday school setting we happen to be in, and we go, you know what, that's worth remembering. We have these Thanksgiving lessons scattered all throughout our lives, and we either learn them or we don't. Some of the thanks lessons actually find themselves directed to a single day this day in November that we, we actually call it a day, Thanksgiving. We name it. Now, it may just be me, but I, I've noticed that, that in the last few years, you got Halloween, which is a day. And then you have Christmas, which is kind of a season. And it seems to me that they're getting closer together. And what's getting smaller seems to be Thanksgiving. Now, think about it. I have no doubt that this coming Thursday, when I get up in the morning, there are going to be parades. There's going to be football games. There's going to be all sorts of food to eat. There'll be Black Friday sales the next day. And I'm good with all of that. None of that's a problem for me. But I want us to think about if it all went away, if all of that went away, Thursday would still be a great day for us to give thanks to God. You see, what I hope, traditions may change and things may appear and disappear. What I hope can never be eliminated is God's people giving God thanks. If we lose that, we've lost everything. More than anyone in this world, people should see Jesus' followers thanking God. Now, Solomon, King Solomon, known throughout history for the building of of Jerusalem's great temple, known for his, um, his wisdom, his wealth, his wives, I haven't figured out how all three of those go together. Lots of wives and wisdom and wealth. Um, But I think that's already a problematic place to take the sermon. So I'm going to go a different direction. Solomon comes to this point late in his life. He's looking back across his life and he's thinking about what are some things that I've learned along the way. You get to the fifth chapter of Ecclesiastes. And Solomon says, this is what I've observed. Let me me share it with you, verse 18. This is what I have observed to be good, that it is appropriate for a person to eat, to drink, and to find satisfaction in their toilsome labor under the sun during the few days of life God has given them. For this is their lot, this is their life. 
Moreover, when God gives someone wealth and possessions and the ability to enjoy them, to accept their lot and be happy in their toil, this is a gift from God. They seldom reflect on the days of their life because God keeps them occupied with gladness of heart. Where's Solomon going with this? Well, when you read these words or you hear these words read, you come to this clear picture that God at some level desires us to have a good life or to be good in the life that we have. Look at the words that Solomon chooses. Eat, drink, satisfaction, enjoy, happy, gift. Underlying all of these is a measure of contentment. It's interesting because this is sort of the thought line laced all through Ecclesiastes and the writing of Solomon. If you go back to the first chapter, Solomon tells us there's nothing new under the sun. This is life. Ecclesiastes 3, there's an appropriate time and a season for everything. Solomon's synopsis of life is that we should choose to live fully and wisely and well in the moment that's right before us. Now, if you begin to enact that way of living in your life, you'll understand that it comes down to a choice. We either live life content or discontent. And if that's true, then in every house of worship this morning, In every home where there are people living, in every bar where there are people drinking, in every stadium where there are people cheering, in every health club where there are people exercising, in every hospital where someone's dying, there's someone whose deepest thought is, if only I were like him, if only I were like her, And the consequence of that is we find ourselves with lots of people living discontented lives. Whole homes, whole churches filled up with discontented people. If only I were stronger, if only I were taller, if only I were cuter, if only I were smarter, if only I was younger, if only I was older. Remember when you were young enough to wish that one? That's been a while for me. If only I were healthier. If only I were wealthier. Then my life would be the way that it should be. And then I would give God my thanks. If only my parents were different. If only my kids were different. If only my job were different. Then I'd be set. Then I'd be satisfied. And then I'd thank God, if only. You know, to me, the very fact that human beings so naturally and so often default to that way of thinking tells me how valuable it is for us to live and learn what it means to be content. What exactly is contentment, really, and why does God seem to think it matters? I actually kind of coined a little phrase for this message as I was working on it, and the phrase is present thanksgiving. It's a little different than thanksgiving in the present. It's It's a way of living. I'm going to live in this present thanksgiving. And I want to share with you three Three truths that I gleaned in this message. And the first is that present thanksgiving is contentment. Now, most of us, when we hear that word contentment, we define it almost entirely as uh, from a passive perspective. Like someone who's just finished their second helping of Thanksgiving dinner, including at least one, if not more than one piece of pie. Someone says, would you like more? And they say, oh, no, nothing else for me. I'm content. Well, good Lord, I would hope so. (laughs) 
Why did they even bother to ask? To live a life of contentment, to live a life of present thanksgiving is in no way that kind of passive. Solomon's counsel to us is pretty clear. We eat, we drink, we work, and we find our way to be satisfied in the midst of it. It's not a passive satisfaction for what we have. It's a fully active one. G.K. Chesterton was a famous pastor and and wordsmith, and uh, he said this about contentment. He said, true contentment is a thing as active as agriculture. It's the power of getting out of any situation all there is in it. Nothing is wasted. Look across the spectrum of our human lives Look, about, look, at, uh, look at us in regard to our human relationships. Do we make the most of our relationships? Our tendency is to say, well, you know, I, I don't exactly have the relationship that I'm looking for. Some folks will say, you know, I used to have it and I, I lost that person. Or someone will say, you know what, I'm longing for that person and I don't have that relationship right now. I'm not dating, I'm not married. I don't have friends, at least not lots of them. I'm not from around here, I haven't met anyone. And all those things might be true But while we may not have the relationships that we desire, are we making the most of the relationships we do have? Are we following up with the neighbor that we just happened to bump into? Are we, here's a crazy question, are we we showing up for the multiple events that our church seems to offer ad nauseum in the bulletin every week? You see, contentment is about maximizing what you do have to see what you could have rather than focusing on what you don't have. Let me say that again. Contentment is about maximizing what you do have to see what you could have rather than focusing on what you don't have. And contentment isn't surrendering our dreams and our desires. Contentment is having a proper perspective between what we have in our hand and what we are reaching out for. Present thanksgiving is contentment. And it's also now. It's true that present thanksgiving is now, And part of the reason that's true is if we do a really good job with now, it can have a huge implication for the future. Because today I might find myself in a situation I never wanted to be in, don't want to be in. I might find myself in the middle of some hurt, some difficulty, some wound, some brokenness. And more than anything in this situation, I want to make the kind of choices that can help me to ensure that I don't recreate this situation in my future. I can take the awful right now to build a better what's next. Contentment is making the most of the now, but it doesn't mean that we we aren't actively taking steps to improve what's yet to come. When Solomon writes in verse 19, to accept their lot. He isn't implying passive acceptance of awful. He's not saying, well, I guess this is all I'm meant to have. I guess this is supposed to be my life. He's saying, this is what I currently have. How can I live fully in it? How can I maximize it? How can I find all the joy that there is in this moment for God's glory? 
Now, some of you are old enough to remember this television show, MacGyver. You guys remember MacGyver? I, I never watched it. I can tell you one thing, though. I, this is not a really good picture. That guy had an amazing mullet. That guy had really good hair. But that's not why I showed you that, and that's not why I'm talking about it. If you remember the, the plot line of the show, every week he's in the midst of some life-threatening, uh, planet-annihilating situation from which there is seemingly no escape. And then somehow, he reaches into his pocket, and he is able to, to, to create a bomb with a, a stick of gum and a tube of toothpaste and a comb. Now, that's a really bad illustration, but it, it points to someone who's not just sitting back and saying, oh, well, I guess there's no way out of this. He accepted where he was at, but then he figured out how to make the most of it. It's, for us, it's saying, all right, Lord, this is where you've placed me. This is the situation I find myself in. Here's what I've got on my plate. Here's what I've got on my schedule. Here are the people I've got in my life. Show me what you've called me to do so I can live into it. That's contentment. That's present thanksgiving. That's contentment in the now, and it's a choice. It really is a choice. One of the most valuable things that we learn when we read through the book of Ecclesiastes is that life is short. Your life, my life, the people we love, their lives, we all want more of what we love and who we love. And the truth is that there's no amount of exercise and dieting and genetic engineering or cosmic cosmetic surgery that ultimately changes that life is not as long as we would like it to be. Solomon writes in verse 18, the, the few days of life God has given them. And he isn't being negative. He's not being fatalistic. He's trying to help us to avoid this treadmill of life that we seem to always put ourselves on where we are constantly living for tomorrow and missing today. Somehow, tomorrow is so much better than today that I just don't even need to think about where I'm at right now. Solomon's offering a perspective to that little voice that so often speaks in our heads that tells us, you need something more. You need someone else. You need to be somewhere you're not right now. That voice keeps us from fully appreciating or enjoying what we have right now. I want you to look at the screens up here. Whichever screen you're looking at, what do you, what do you see up here? All right. I'm not going to ask you to show your hands, but a lot of us, I'm a, I'm a black dot person. A lot of us look up here and we go, oh, it's a black dot. Really? What's the biggest thing up there? It's not a black dot. It's this huge expanse of white. But somehow, our human nature causes us to do that same thing. We miss the huge because we're focused on the small. We pass by the great big good because our eyes are drawn to the tiny little bad. Solomon's saying the same thing. There's so many people who go through this short life and almost all they focus on every single day is their black dot. Life is fleeting. Look at the white space and live into that. You know, Adam and Eve are, are perfect examples of what I'm talking about. God places them in a garden named Eden. You know what Eden means, translated? It means delights. God placed them in a garden of delights. They're in a garden filled with thousands of trees of yes, 
and one tree of no. And where do they go? Everything changed when they convinced one another that they could make a better choice about what God was offering them than they could. And so they made their choice. And did their lives get better? Did that go well for them? Dreaming of where they were not yet to be and missing where they already were. St. Augustine famously said in his confessions, Oh God, our hearts are restless until they find their rest in you. We experience contentment by turning to God and, and trusting him completely. Trusting that he's good and that he's given us everything, not that we want right now, but everything we need right now. To wrap all this up, present thanksgiving is found in Christ. It's found in Christ. To me, the reason that thanking God for the present is so important for us is because it's entirely possible for us to receive this gift that we talk about in Jesus Christ, but not to live our lives as contented people. You know people like that who have a faith in Jesus, who've lived their life of faith, but they live it with almost no joy. Their face has no joy. Their soul has a relationship with Jesus, but it's expressed seemingly not a bit. I've been a pastor for over 40 years. I grew up in the church since I was, well, since I was born. And there are people that walk around the church and live out their faith life in Jesus Christ like they were dipped in vinegar. You want to pull them aside and go, hey, you know what? You're not helping with the marketing very much. Live joy, but only because you find contentment. A person of faith can be godly, but still lack contentment, still unable to release themselves to trust God enough that this moment, God is with them. You know who discovered this secret? The Apostle Paul, Philippians chapter 4. He says, I've, I've, I've found a secret. Let me read it to you, starting at verse 11. I'm not saying this because I am in need, for I have learned to be content there's the word, whatever the circumstances. I know what it is to be in need, and I know what it is to have plenty. I have learned the secret of being content. There's the word. In any and every situation, whether well-fed or hungry, whether living in plenty or in want, I can do all this through him, that's Jesus, who gives me strength. Paul doesn't tell us it's obvious he doesn't tell us it's plainly visible. He doesn't tell us everyone will find it. He tells us it's available, the secret. It's right here, and it's real, and it's available through what we can find in a relationship with Jesus Christ. But we have to choose it, and we have to seek it, and we have to live into it in such a way that it becomes magnetic not only for us, but everyone in the world says, I want some of what they've got. In fact, I want it all. So my desire is that each of you, all of you, as you walk out of this place today, you leave here not only with the gift of eternal life because you have a relationship with God through Jesus Christ, but that you gain a measure of godliness because the life you have right now is the gift that God has given you. And that you have this incredible blessing that you will live the rest of your days, each of your days, no matter how many of those days, in contented moments. Church, today is our opportunity to make the most of today. Present thanksgiving. And if this day leads us all the way to Thursday, don't forget to go back for seconds. 
And that's the truth. So as the cell comes and as we get ready for our final hymn, let me pray a prayer of blessing for the week that's ahead of us, for the days that are ahead of us. I want blessings for you. I want you to feel God's arms wrapped around you as you live into your plans this week. But more than that, I want you to to live into your plans this week in such a way that people, people want the contented life that they see that you found. Let me, let me pray for that right now. God, I just ask for these people to find the magnetic pull of a, of a life lived with your son, Jesus. The forgiveness that he offers, the new life that is in store, that all of that is something that we live into. God, I ask that that would be such a persuasive force in the life of those that we're going to encounter this week. And I, I pray that that begins today, right here, right now. Prepare us for the rest of life in this moment of life. Present Thanksgiving. Amen.